if you're not good, it's not fun. You know, it gets boring. It's yeah. like surfing. If you don't know how to surf and you're just catching the white water and stuff like that, you're going to surf a little bit, then you'll give it up because it's, it's not fun. But if you surf every day and you learn how to surf and you get better waves and bigger waves and you start getting barrels and you start doing cutbacks and you're like, whoa, the better you get, the more fun it's going to get. And that's how jujitsu is. Yeah. The better you get, the more fun it's going to get. If you train once a week, that shit's going to suck forever, dude. You're going to, it's going to be horrible. Arte sempre fez parte da minha vida. Talvez o primeiro grande sinal tenha vindo através da música. Alguns anos depois do design, a fotografia, a arquitetura, a moda, um universo profissional riquíssimo em cultura, comportamento e conhecimento. Como surfista, kite surfista, lutador, aprendi que o esporte vai muito além da competição. O mar, o vento, a montanha, são os elementos da natureza que me movem, me conectam com a minha verdadeira essência. Eu acredito que devemos agradecer a tudo que temos de cultivar nossas amizades, pois é um dos maiores valores que temos na vida. Tudo é energia. Vamos celebrar a arte de viver. O Pura Connection é mais um projeto de vida que trago ídolos, referências, mestres e amigos que fiz durante essa intensa jornada. Uma verdadeira conexão humana com o propósito de espalhar visões, experiências e mensagens positivas para mim. Always What's a up, pleasure brother? to receive a guy like you, and very special for me, and a challenge to do it in English. But it's, it's the second episode. Hey, it was your idea. Yeah, <laughs> you, you were just. I came. I came. The last three days, I was mentally preparing my Portuguese. Like, man, we're gonna do one hour conversation in Portuguese. It's gonna be tough. But then you said English. I'm like, let's go. No yeah. problem. Yeah, for me, it's a, it's a great challenge, but I, I think it's important to expand this message to the, yeah, of the world, you know? And we have a lot of, of jiu-jitsu masters that, Brazilians that speak in English. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I receive a lot of message from, from people in the U.S. that wants to, to hear some much some, some yeah. of, of those guys speaking in English so let's do it yeah sick thank you for your time your energy and you're a reference for me also because of your jiu-jitsu in your vision you know you you I, I think you connect a lot of jiu-jitsu culture and arts and bring a lot of the essence of jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. and you and you are a Brazilian guy mm -hmm. right yeah Yeah, I was born in uh, in Bahia, mm -hmm. Ilhéus. Uh, mom and dad are Brazilian as it gets. Um, I moved to California when I was six years old, five, six years old, in 1999 mm -hmm. with my parents. And um, yeah, I've been there ever since. Nice. And in what age did you start Jiu-Jitsu? So I, my dad started training jiu-jitsu uh, the year that I was born, in 1993, in, uh, in Ilhéus with Daniel Valverde. Mm -hmm. um, and then back in those days, there wasn't too many gyms that had like kids classes and stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I have like little memories of going to the training with my dad playing around on the mat, you know? In, in, in Ilhéus? In Ilhéus, yeah. Raiz was the name of the gym. Nice. Academia Raiz. Roots. Yeah. And um, playing around on the mats there and stuff, but I even have, like, some pictures and stuff on the mats there, but never, like, really trained, you know? And then 
I started training consistently when I was like nine in in the States, in San Diego. Is. Yeah. And with, with whom did you start? It was, uh, so in this time I was like playing other sports, soccer, football. Um, and my dad, he, when we moved to the States, he took a little break from jujitsu. He was a purple belt. Mm -hmm. He took a little break from jujitsu. He was working a lot. We just moved there. My mom, dad, me and two sisters. So family of five, no money, you know? So my dad was working like crazy. Mom was working like crazy. So he didn't have time to train a lot. He was still training mm -hmm. one, sometimes here, sometimes there. Um, he was training at, at, with Rodrigo Medeiros a little oh, nice. bit because nice. it was close to where he worked. And then this gym, we lived in Oceanside. I don't know if you know where yeah, that's yeah. at, like North County, San yeah. Diego. Yeah. And this gym opened up there, uh, Marcelo Pereira. Marcelo Pereira. And my dad started teaching classes there because Marcelo had two schools. He had Nelson went to Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. and Marcelo took over his school in Del Mar, and so he had the two schools at the time. And then, so my dad started teaching in the Oceanside School like two days a week, and uh, my mom would pick me up from football practice and then drop me off at the gym and then I'd go home with my dad you know and I would always just watch mm -hmm. and because there was no kids class and in this in this town Oceanside it's like a military town yeah there they have the biggest military base in in America so the gym was like very hardcore very hardcore compared to like the the other one that was like in del mar like a nice fancy rich town you know mm -hmm. that was like the one where all the like private classes yeah. and all that stuff the oceanside one was like military dudes that wanted to be fighters and a lot of the guys like they didn't train very long because they were in the military they'd be there for six months and then go to a different place for mm -hmm. you know and so I would always go and watch and sometimes jump on the mat. And then one day, Marcelo's brother was uh, visiting from Brazil. And uh, after class, he like grabbed me and he's like, oh, do an arm bar. And then I did like a, a just basic arm bar for mount on him. And then he's like, okay, do an Americana. And I did like an Americana. He's like, do a Kimura. And I didn't know how to do a Kimura. Mm -hmm. And he started making fun of me. He's like, man, you don't know how to do a Kimura. You don't know who Kimura is, blah, 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 blah. That's like the most famous move in jujitsu, this and that. And then on the way home that day, I like told my dad, I'm like, dude, I got to start training. Like that, that was stupid. I don't know this. I don't know that, blah, blah, blah. And then so the next day, he's like, he got me a gi and threw me into the adult class, you know, and I would go to the two classes that he would teach. Tuesday, Thursdays, and started like that, like in the adult class. And then I remember one day this kid showed up to the gym and he was like one year older than me, maybe like 10 or 11 years old. And his dad was like, hey, do you guys have kids class? And Marcel was like, no, we don't have kids class here. Go look for another gym. And I saw I was like get putting my gi on and I tell Marcel, I was like, hey, Marcel, come on. Let the kid train so I have a partner, you know? And he's like, okay, but here's the deal. You guys have to come together every day and train together. Mm -hmm. So you don't mess up the adults training, you know? So then, and this kid was a judo kid. His dad was a judo black belt, Dan Henderson's stand-up wrestling coach. And so the kid was already really good, you know? Fala, galera. Sou mais de 30 anos de Jiu-Jitsu, 25 anos competindo em alto nível. Hoje trago para você, em português, para o Brasil, a guarda diamante. Está na hora de evoluir, resistir à pressão e se transformar na melhor versão de você mesmo. Os.
And then he came every day. Like we made a deal like Monday to Thursday. We'll come to the six o'clock class. And then that's how it started. Me and him like training every single day together. It's crazy because I remember like we would do every round like the during the sparring you know there's like 10 rounds me and the kid would do like eight rounds together and then like maybe one round i would do with my dad one round i would do with marcelo and the same with the kid you know mm -hmm. but we would train with each other every single round over and over and over and he beat the shit out of me because yeah. he was like training to be like an olympic judoka you know so he was already really good at the age of 10 and i knew nothing and then that really helped me that showed me like for me to get better than this kid i can't just come to the same classes that he goes because then he's always going to be a little bit better than me you know yeah so then i started like telling my dad like hey what's up let's go somewhere on saturday like Let's go to an open mat or to a class on Saturday. or, And then we started training on the weekends and I started catching up a little bit. And then eventually it became like even, you know, after like a year or two, me and the kid were like the same level. Nice. Do you have contact with this, this guy? I don't. Not anymore. I, I, um, he went off to like do wrestling in college and a little bit of MMA fights and then kind of just disappeared. I never really heard about him too much. I think his dad put like a little too much pressure on him yeah. when he was really young. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I was fucking nine years old, this kid was already talking about being in the Olympics when he was 16, you know? He's like, oh, his dad's like, when he's 16, he's going to be Olympic champion. Ba, 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 ba. The kid never went to school a day in his life never went to school he just did homeschooling you know mm -hmm. and now that's a lot more common yeah but back then it was like yeah only for like the top of the top at professional athletes or whatever is like homeschooled you know but um yeah i think he got a little burnt out yeah just this is a problem right because yeah i already heard a lot of stories about the father yeah. putting pressure on the kids to, yeah to like to to follow the same path as, as yeah yeah it's crazy man the the a lot of people put that kind of pressure i was talking to uh like the other day i was talking to my friends that are here with me they train at aoj and mm -hmm. they said that like there's a dad there that like puts all this pressure on the kid and like yells at the kid during training you know and like yeah. if he taps out he'll call him over and be like hey come here pa And that, like, uh, one of the coaches there, like, yelled at the dad and said, like, hey, you either put a gi on and help everybody in the class, all the kids, or shut up and leave, you know? And they made a rule that, like, there's no parent coaching and stuff like that, you know? Because a lot of the parents, they, they're, like, too scared to do the do jujitsu, you know? But they, mm -hmm. like, try to put that pressure and... It's a different kind of sport than like baseball or soccer, yeah. and, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of variables. And I was very lucky that like my dad, um, he didn't really put that kind of pressure on me. My dad like surfed a lot. The, the reason we moved to California is because he just loved surfing. He loved California, loved surfing. He would travel there to surf with his friends and stuff like that. And so I grew up like... I would miss school in the morning to go surf with my dad, you know, like if the waves are perfect, he was like, okay, we're going to go to school late. We'll go surf early 7 a.m. and I'll take you to school like 8, 39, you know, something like that. So I always grew up with that, like, yeah, we're going to train jujitsu every day, but it's not like only jujitsu every day, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't that kind of pressure. So it, he kind of showed me like, here's jujitsu, you can suck. You're gonna do it every day and you can suck and get beat up or you can try really hard and be good and i think that um there was a lot of times where i didn't want to go but it, he like took me anyways and then after the training you feel great you know that whole like story of like yeah well, you don't yeah. want to go and then you go and then you feel great afterwards mm -hmm. and 
I think there has to be a balance of with parents of putting pressure. Like I see, I taught kids classes for 10 years and I see a lot of like parents who don't put enough pressure, you know, or, or force on the kids. Like they, the kid says, Oh, I don't want to go. And they're like, yeah. okay, we don't go. Yeah. And I think the problem with that is if you're not good, it's not fun. You know, it gets boring. It's yeah. like surfing. If you don't know how to surf and you're just catching the white water and stuff like that, you're going to surf a little bit, then you'll give it up because it's, it's not fun. But if you surf every day and you learn how to surf and you get better waves and bigger waves and you start getting barrels and you start doing cutbacks and you're like, whoa, the better you get, the more fun it's going to get. And that's how jujitsu is. Yeah. The better you get, the more fun it's going to get. If you train once a week, the shit's going to suck forever, dude. You're going to, it's going to be horrible. Yeah, exactly. You know? I, I just had half Gracie here. Yeah. And I he, saw half last week. Yeah. Yeah. The contest it was an excellent podcast. And he just told like that it's very important to, to try to put the kid on because this kind of uh, story that the kid don't, don't want to go is, is normal Dude, right everything Because, bro yeah the kid doesn't want to eat healthy food and and he, and he he makes the the he compares with with school because exactly jiu-jitsu is very important to the formation you know mm -hmm. of of the person yeah uh, so yeah it's like a school yeah exactly it's it's kids you can't let kids just do whatever they want uh, they'll they'll dress up like a dinosaur you know yeah. and fucking yeah. like you can't yeah. just like there has to be some kind of order and i think that um a lot of parents like from experience of seeing it and teaching kids classes i think that a lot of parents want to give their kids like every option you know and yeah. never say no to the kid especially in this world now they want to be like yes for everything and um The kid doesn't know what he wants, you know? And, and yeah. if you take a, a kid and put him in a jiu-jitsu class his first week, he's going to hate it because everybody's better than them. You yeah. know, if you walk into a jiu-jitsu class and it's your first day, everyone in the room is better than you, mm -hmm. you know? So it, it sucks. It's You get beat up by everyone. Only 10% of the people like that, you know? The only 10% are like, oh, this is fuck. Yeah, I want to get... 90% are like, whoa, this is crazy, dude. I lost everybody. Bah. But if you put a little bit of pressure, put a little bit of time, take the kid anyways and put, put some pressure on that. Like Half said, like kids don't want to go to school. I didn't want to go to school, you know? My, yeah, but you yeah, have to. But you have to, yeah. you know? And after you're done and you graduate, you're like, thank God I did that, you know? So in my life experience, I went to school, I graduated in, in, in university, but now I know how jiu-jitsu was and is important for me, you know, mm -hmm. in life, my yeah. life, yeah. because of the principles, you know, yeah. discipline and, of and course. all the network I, 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 I make and the connections yeah. I, I have. Yeah. So for me is like was the most valuable school for me yeah no for sure i think it's uh even just like the people that are in jujitsu you know there's no like scumbag bad people type of in yeah. jujitsu like those kinds of people go away yeah you exactly. know so especially for a kid like for me i was always with my dad you know always with my dad um He was the type of dad that like uh, on the weekends when he didn't work, we were together all the time. Surf, jujitsu, ba. I'd be, I was hanging out with his friends, you know, I was rarely like when I was really young, hanging out with my friends, you know, I was always hanging out with my friends during school, during the week, but on the weekends is like always hanging out with my dad and, um, daddy, like he, we used to go to the gracie baja headquarters mm -hmm. on the weekends you know and and uh in irvine and that was when like uh carlinos was there full-time masio fetosa was there full-time you know and um 
we would always hang out with those guys on the weekend and and those are like great people to be around you know yeah. to to go to lunch with and to learn about health and about life and about business you know and i was always like this little kid just hanging out there oh my gosh what's up with these guys you know like kind of quiet you know mm -hmm. and sometimes i'd be so quiet they would start talking shit like qual é a magia pô não fala português não não entende não para you know and i'm like uh, you know and like they even help me like develop portuguese and stuff like that and i think it's it's a great culture to be around yeah. you know whether you're a kid or an adult it's always great people to be around um everybody kind of has like the same mindset you know yeah health fitness exactly. longevity exactly yeah and it's i a good see lifestyle. I, I, i like to see jiu-jitsu as a, a life philosophy you know yeah not just martial arts like or a sport but it's it's more than uh, it's like lifestyle yeah exactly yeah, that connects like like you said health or food yeah and wellness and what you read what you see with whom you you you, you go out you hang out so yeah i think f for this reason jiu-jitsu for me is, is the most special school that we yeah. can have in, in in life you know yeah it's like like henzo says there's more philosophy in in a jiu-jitsu school than there is in an ivy league college yeah you know there's yeah. you can learn so much yeah. in a jiu-jitsu school and even the people that you hang out with there could be lawyers doctors exactly you know smart business people like every connection every contact i have is because of jiu-jitsu Yeah, and we we learn a, a lot about humans and 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 the relationships also now because yeah. we 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 don't have this type of uh, discrimination like yeah exactly if the guy don't have money or if yeah. he's a black person or yeah. if he, uh, we're all the same on the mats yeah, yeah. exactly so th all this experience is like f for life and for our like I said, our formation, graduation in life is, is very important. Yeah. Because make, we, we don't learn this in, in school. Yeah. Right? It, it, it makes, it makes you different. You know, if you're yeah. a jujitsu guy, if you've trained every day with people, different kinds of people and stuff like that, it's, it makes you a good person. Yeah. There's no way to not be a good person. Yeah. If you train jujitsu for five, 10 years, When did you turn like your mindset to be a competitor and not just train jiu-jitsu, but really focus on, on training and on competitions? Yeah, man. So the it's funny because like I, the, the first tournament I did, I think I was like 10 years old, yellow belt. Mm -hmm. I lost to that kid who was in the class. We met in the finals and I lost to him. And he was way better than me at that time, you know? And and he was like a little bit bigger than me, one age older than me. And it was an in-house tournament, so not too many kids. Everybody kind of mixed up white belts with orange belts, blah, 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 blah. And then, and I got second place. And then, um, like the next tournament I did, was like forced you know because i lost that one my dad's like no you have to do it come on come on blah, blah, blah. and then i won and then after that i i like it, it was always so scary to compete as a little kid you know 
because you never knew where you were going to fight. You could fight like a girl, mm -hmm. you know, that was like a green belt or a bigger, like a, you could be a 12-year-old boy and fight a 14-year-old girl in your division. You're like, what the fuck, you know? Yeah. And so it was always like this kind of pressure and it got to the point where like my dad wouldn't even tell me that we were going to a tournament. He'd be like, oh no, we're going to this tournament to coach the students. You're not going to compete. And then we'd get there and he'd be like, you're up. <laughs> and I'm like, what? No way. And he's like, no, you have to go or else you're going to walk home, you know? And then I would like compete and win. And I, I realized like, hey, I'm training way more than these kids, you know? So I should win. And um, I think you start to realize that as a competitor, like I realized that really young, like, you know, if you're going to do well in a tournament and if you've been preparing yourself mm -hmm. versus not, you know, and I think the moment that it clicked that made me want to be a, a professional jujitsu athlete competitor and take my life um, was in ADCC in 2005. There was the ADCC in Long Beach. Mm hmm. And my dad's original professor, uh, Daniel Valverde, was in the alternate. They had, so back in, that, in those days, they had the like alternate spot. Mm -hmm. They had a tournament for it, or not a tournament, a super fight, right? So before the tournament, before the actual ADCC, early in the morning, two guys from every weight division, or two, two guys would fight for the spot in case somebody got hurt or mm -hmm. didn't make the weight, mm -hmm. you know? And he was in that alternate spot. Um, so my dad had a, he came to, he was living in Miami and cause he has a school there, MMA masters. He, he was teaching at American top team back in the day. Um, so he came to California. He was staying at our house. He stayed in my room. I like had to give him my bed, you know, and sleep on the couch and, and I'm like, what is this guy doing? Some big tournament here, you know, this ADCC thing. I had no clue. I was like 12 years old. And then we went to the ADCC and my dad uh, was, a, was a photographer for like Gracie Mag and stuff back yeah. in the day. And so he had like a media pass. And then um, Danielle gave me his coach's pass. So I was this like 12 year old kid with a coach pass on my neck and just like walking around like ADCC, like, you know, in the backstage and seeing all these guys. And I remember specifically this moment, like I went to go sit in this VIP area and um, the guy, the guy like kicked me out of the VIP area. It was like the front row right there on the pyramid. And the guy that was working just some random uh security guard guy he's like oh you can't be in this area this is only for vip you have a coach's pass you can be on the floor but you can't be in seating here and padgy panda was sitting in the vip area and he's like hey molek and then like he took off his pass his vip pass and put his vip pass on my neck took his coach's pass because he wanted to go like coach somebody you know uh -huh. and he like picks me up over the fence and puts me in the seat and jumps over and goes to coach. And then I was like, just sitting there like next to all these guys, like, whoa, <laughs> you know? And then it, it was, it happened to be during the Marcelo Garcia match with Hiko Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. And then watching that moment, how Marcelo like treated that situation made me fall in love with competition. And with Marcelo Garcia, I was like, so blown away and i think that moment made made it click i was like man i want to i want to be an adcc one day you nice. know yeah you 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 lived a very special time in jiu-jitsu yeah right? yeah when we it was in the transition when it was yeah, moving exactly. to california and we just moved to california you know so it was that was right before the and then the next year was the first world's Mm -hmm. that they did in California 2006 and I was like like we I trained at the Gracie Ball headquarters and Carlinhos owns IBJJF and all those guys that run IBJJF now Andre, Siriema, they were all T 
teaching at at the at the headquarters you know and i was always that like orange belt in the class literally class like the saturday class that masio or or andre or cdm taught mm -hmm. was like crazy it was like 20 black belts on the mat you know 10 20 black belts on the mat and i was like the kid you know orange belt there and so every when the worlds came and then all these IBJJF tournaments came i was like the worker you know i was always at the table flipping points or you know so nice. it was really cool to 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 have that experience i've been flipping points for like like Hajar Gracie matches and Andre Galvan matches and Braulio Stima matches, you know, like sitting front row on the table, flipping points in that experience is priceless, you know. Priceless, yeah. Yeah. And how important was to be training with like adults, uh, being a kid? And no, and, it was and it was incredible. It was they they really took me under their wing, you know. They mm -hmm. saw the that had potential and always helped me out and um i remember like kira gracie would come to do like the camps at worlds and i would always be her drilling partner because i like when i was like thir 13 14 15 like green belt i was like a little more her size you know mm -hmm. so we would always be drilling and I would train with her a bunch and she would beat the shit out of me and everybody would make fun of me, you know, like, oh, you're getting your ass kicked by Kira, pa. and I'm like, dude, yeah, but it was really, it was really special to be a kid in a, in a, in a room like that and, um, and having my dad being there too, you know, um, a lot, those guys really like took me under their wing and helped me out a lot. Nice. And like I said in, in the the beginning of our talk, you you bring with with your brand a little bit of the essence of Jiu Jitsu, right? You like the culture, like I yeah. said. And what made you you see Jiu Jitsu? Because you you grew up in a in a in a new era, right? Mm -hmm. Jiu Jitsu was already a lot of sportive mm -hmm. and all these competitions but you you bring like surf and, and jiu-jitsu and all this the, those connections you know that for me make makes part of our history yeah and it's very important because i think like we said also the the, the philosophy and the lifestyle is what makes jiu-jitsu very interesting you know yeah. that gracie history with a mixture of art and and acai and yeah. the Brazilian food and all those the fights music, and the yeah. music yeah exactly I I think this makes Jiu Jitsu very special and very unique mm -hmm. also right mm -hmm. and I think you you captured that mm -hmm. and you you still keep passing this message mm -hmm. on right yeah it just honestly it's all credit to my dad man if you if I think about it like that it's he that was his lifestyle it was surf in the morning go to work teach jujitsu at night every day he still does that shit mm -hmm. you know he's still on the mats every day surfs it's it, it's all credit to him and he kind of showed me the way like that and um i started to get those kinds of friends you know that were interested in the same stuff and it, it was kind of weird because like I never, in in school, in high school and stuff like that, I never had friends that trained jiu-jitsu. No? You know, never. I would, dude, my dad would tell me like, hey, all your friends can train for free. No problem, you know? And nobody wanted to do it. I had a couple that would go once in a while, but everybody just wanted to party and do other sports. And jiu-jitsu was tough back then. It was a little bit tougher, you know? And, and it was intimidating to be in a room full of adults yeah. who were trying to be like MMA fighters or whatever, you know? So I never really had friends that trained jujitsu, but I had friends that like surfed, you know? So I had like two separate groups of friends and, mm -hmm. and uh, like the jujitsu guys that were the, like the adults, 
you know and then like the kids who were like the surfers and stuff who i'd get like dropped off at the beach with or something like that so um i was kind of always just i think that that now that i think about it that kind of uh made like my mix so powerful because i wasn't hanging out with people that like did a little bit of surfing and a little bit of jiu-jitsu you know i was hanging out with like surfers 100 percent hardcore surfers and then 100 percent hardcore jiu-jitsu guys you know and my dad was like the one that was like both mm -hmm. and then so i started becoming like in that mix of like both and then um eventually i when i got like my purple belt when i was like a little bit older um leg locks become legal and stuff like that you know foot mm -hmm. locks and leg locks and uh joel tudor had just opened his school the original surf fight there in in san diego um i think it was in like 2009 or 10 or something like that 2010 and yeah when i got my my dad was friends with joel from from training at rodrigo's they knew each other and when I got my purple belt, my dad was like, hey, this dude Joel's really good at footlocks. You got to start going training with him like once a week at least to get up on the leg locks and stuff like that. And then so I started going there once a week and on Monday nights. Monday nights was always like my night off at my dad's school because mm -hmm. there was no kids class. I would teach the kids class on like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And do the night training and then i would teach a competition class on friday night at my dad's school and so monday nights was like my dad's night and i had the night off and when i got my driver's license i'd always go train at somebody else's gym my one of my dad's friends you know like rafael dalia or joel's or somebody else's gym and so your your father had a, a baja my dad yeah 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 your dad yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and then um yeah, so I taught there ever since I was 13. I was teaching kids' classes, mm -hmm. you know? And then eventually, um, yeah, he told me to start going training with Joel. And then I seen, like, how how Joel's uh, influence of, like, or connection of, like, jujitsu and surfing, how powerful it was, you know? And how he, like, had this school, uh, little school. He basically opened this school um because he just didn't want to drive anymore to train he mm -hmm. lived in del mar and rodrigo's is in pb and he fucking drove there every single day to train twice a day for 10 years after he got his black belt and stuff he was like man i gotta open my own spot closer to my house and it was a little school you know um very small like a little bit bigger than this mat little bit mm -hmm. and i would go there and I kind of started seeing more that culture of like surfers training jujitsu, you know, because before it was always jujitsu guys training jujitsu, surfers surfing, mm -hmm. hard to mix the both because a lot of people are like, oh, I don't want to get hurt doing jujitsu and not be able to surf and pa pa pa, you know, because yeah, a lot yeah. of like hardcore surfers are like my knees, my knees, my knee, everybody, you know, I don't want to hurt my knees, and so. When I started going to train at Joel's, um, that had a lot more of that culture, you know, and surfboards on the walls and started learning a lot more about surf history and stuff like that. And it really like stapled that connection um, of like surfing and fighting, surf yeah, fight. And Joel is like, it's incredible how, how he, he was a world champion in Jiu Jitsu and, and yeah. also in surfing yeah. right no yeah, yeah. the guy it, it, like people ask me all the time like does it's a lot of people who like train jujitsu and a lot of people who don't who are just surfers and stuff they ask me a lot of time like hey does joel like train like a lot is he good at, like a lot of people are like hey is he yeah. good at jujitsu you know like black belts would be like hey is joel like really good and i'm like dude the motherfucker trains more than me he trains every single class every like we own this school together you know mm -hmm. surf fight mm -hmm. and people always message me or ask me like hey 
when can I go there to visit you guys? You know, when can I go there to take a class from yeah. you? Or when can I go there to take a class from Joel? I'm like, just show up. We're here. Me and Joel are here at every single class. And it's crazy to think about because he has to maintain the surfing thing. Yeah. You know, he has yeah. to still, yeah. that's his job. That's his main job. Mm -hmm. But he is there at every single class, every day at noon, every night at 630. He's on the mats, training, teaching, doing pull-ups and push-ups. He loves the lifestyle, that lifestyle of, he loves that healthy lifestyle and culture. And, and um, I feel like if you are just a surfer, you can get mixed up in all kinds of other stuff and being lazy and, and whatnot. You know, you can be that super healthy, blah, blah, blah guy, but jujitsu really makes you have to be, you know, you can't smoke cigarettes yeah. and train jujitsu. Yeah. You can't party every night and train jujitsu. You could party a little bit here and there, blah, 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 nothing wrong. But jujitsu forces you to be disciplined. You know, yeah. surfing, you can slack off a little bit more. You can party a little bit more and whatever and just go paddle out and have a surf here and there. But you can't do that with jujitsu, yeah, you know? Exactly. So it, like, forces you to be disciplined. And I think Joel, like, he, that's the key to his success is discipline. You know, he, if the waves are shitty and windy and one foot, he's surfing. He's He's there catching a couple waves, practicing, you know, his fucking longboarding on and um yeah, nonstop and then and then uh training all the time. And he's a world champion, ADCC veteran, you know. He's a beast, man. He's a beast. Yeah, that motherfucker trains a lot. Dude. Incredible. People would be surprised. Yeah. At how good he is at, at jujitsu. I remember like when I first started going to uh, his gym when I was a purple belt. He, he was like, already a black belt? He was already a black belt. He yeah. was already a black belt. He like caught me a couple times, you know? Mm -hmm. He like tapped me. I think he like tapped me once with like a triangle. No, he tapped me twice. He got me in a triangle and some footlock. This like the gas pedal footlock. And I was pissed, you know, because I was like, oh, fuck this like Joel guy. He's like a surfer and he's good, but he's not going to catch me, you know, because I was like competing all the time, purple belt. And he caught me twice. And that shit blew my mind. And then I started going like more and more. And I realized like, oh, this guy actually trains. And then and like he tells like we tell all our students, like there's no secret to this. Like if you want to be better than somebody else, you have to train more than them, you know, and I think that's what Joel did he would go and train at rodrigo's at the 7 a.m class and then he'd go surf and then he'd come back for the night class like every day and i have a jiu-jitsu school i see students who have the time to train twice a day but make excuses yeah. you know and i i try to tell people like especially like uh like maybe not white belts but like blue belts and purple belts like If you want to really level your game up, you have to do two classes in a day, mm -hmm. at least sometimes, maybe not too much, not two classes a day, five days a week and burn yourself out and get hurt or whatever. But especially when you're learning like that at a blue belt level, you have to because it, it like you can see like a blue belt go to class and not get any of the moves right you know the f noon class and he's struggling and having a hard time and then what he's gonna not go the next day and then go the day out you're gonna be struggling every time you go but yeah. if you go twice in the same day you'll notice you picked something up you got better you know you'll try the move you learned at noon on the guys who only go at night you'll and that kind of stuff is the only way to make you better. It's like if you surf, if you surf once a week, you're never going to be good. Yeah. If you surf once a day, you'll be pretty good. If you surf twice a day, you're going to be better than everybody else in the water. You know, yeah. if your surf sessions are 30 minutes versus the guy who's in the water for two and a half hours, you know, that there's no secret to it. It's time, time on the mat, time in the water. Yeah. 
We we were just talking the water. Uh, how U.S. fighters or Jiu-Jitsu fighters they just turn to no gi, right? Mm -hmm. No gi is, is mm -hmm. very strong in mm -hmm. in the U.S. Yeah, it's huge. Right? Yeah, and you it was you were telling me that you were going to to make the ADCC trials mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. U.S. They say, man, this. It's hard, like yeah. it's harder than here in Brazil, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, man. To be honest, like this, this no, this gi no gi talk, right? I have, yeah. I have kind of controversial opinions about this. Um, I think that the way jujitsu is taught to a beginner is wrong. I think that for a guy who's 35 40 50 whatever mid 30s mm -hmm. even 20s whatever age an adult okay to get an adult in 2020 2023 whatever you were in that walks into a school and to put a gi on this guy is crazy that's the worst marketing i think Mm -hmm. To put it, especially if you're in a, a beach city, if you're in a coastal city like San Diego, you know, like we're in Rio right here. Everybody's used to this. Yeah. Board shorts, T-shirt. When you think about a fight, you think of this. Mm -hmm. You think about two guys fighting like this. And I'm not saying that um, like the gi the fighting doesn't work on the streets. Dude, I trained gi my whole life growing up and I can beat anybody up that doesn't do jujitsu no problem like whatever but i've seen it with my own eyes like multiple times a 40 year old walk in the gym for an intro class and i'm like okay here's the gi go to the bathroom this is how you put the pants okay you pull pull the strings put through the loops bah, and then they come out of the bathroom and the pants is backwards yeah. And tied wrong and the belts like up and down and the belts up here you know and like you 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 can tell when a guy knows how to wear a gi yeah you know when a guy looks cool in a gi mm -hmm. you can tell that the guy's been on the mats for a long time and you can tell that uh, like a white belt like looks like kind of nerdy and like uh you know, so I think it's like really intimidating one to put on a gi. It looks stupid, you know, for a beginner guy. You look like you're in like some karate class, right? And then to learn, it makes it way more complicated. Yeah. It's like, think about like a math class, you know, if it's your first time doing math, you learn one plus one, two plus two five plus seven mm -hmm. you don't and then you start learning one times five seven times not you start learning like with the minimal variables you know and then you learn five times x equals zero you know then you start throwing in variables and yeah. equations and this is a way and i think that jujitsu in a gi is so complicated it's so advanced so advanced the gi it's so advanced to put a brand new white belt in a gi is like taking a five-year-old and putting him in an algebra class mm -hmm. it's like the kid doesn't even know numbers teach them numbers first teach them how to count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten yeah. and then teach them how to do the math and i think that like in that situation of wearing a gi in your first couple classes and you, you learn these chokes that you don't have faith in you know and you have this guy saying no trust me man this is pa you grab the lapel and here and you pass to the other side and pa. it's so complicated so complex um i feel like it makes it harder to learn you know the yeah. people will learn eventually they yeah. come every fucking day blah blah blah, yeah. blah 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 they'll end up learning 
Of course, you'll end up learning anything like that if you go every day. But it makes it so complex right、mm-hmm. off the bat, you know? And I think from experience at my own school, like we have fundamental, cl- like my whole life, it, every fundamental class was in the gi. You know, you're not even allowed to do no gi till maybe like blue belt or something like that. You know, like, oh, the no gi class is for the advanced guys.、Mm-hmm. You know, you have to do the gi first, the gi first, the gi first, the gi first. And then now that I've had my school for like three years, I, it was like that. We started it like that. You know, there's, we have、uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday's gi, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, no gi. And, We only had fundamentals classes in the gi for like the first year because I was like, that's the normal, you know? That's how I grew up. That's how Joel、mm-hmm. grew up. That's how everybody knows it. And then this year, I like had this thought about it and, and、uh, talks with、uh, some friends over there, some black belt friends over there about like how the no gi scene is going, you know? How like, Nobody really cares about belts anymore, you know, and it's kind of turning into like this wrestling type、yeah. of thing. A, a room of like, like in wrestling, there's no like, you're the black belt and I'm the brown belt. It's you were better than me today. Yeah. Tomorrow, maybe I'm better than you. Tomorrow, maybe he takes、mm-hmm. us both down and he wins and whatever, you know? And I think that now I have like fundamental classes Monday, Wednesday, and the gi. And then Tuesday, Thursday, Nogi fundamentals. And from experience, it's way easier to teach people in Americana when there's no gi in the way. You know, no questions about, oh, what if I grab this? Oh, what if I hold his belt? Can I hold his belt? Can I choke him with his belt? Yeah. You know, it's like, dude, what the fuck?、Yeah. There's so many questions. Can I pass the lapel around the neck? Can I do this? Can I do that? How do I hold? Why can't I put my fingers inside? You know, like all these things. And the person doesn't even know how to move. They don't even know how to hip escape, you know? And you're telling them, like, oh, you can't grab like this. You have to grab like this. And they don't know how to, like, shoulder roll without hitting their neck, you know? So it's like, I think that there's so many things in jujitsu that you should learn before you, like, I think that the gi should be the advanced. Like, you should, you should do no gi for like three months. And then it's like, everyone.、Okay. Everyone. Every, like, kids in, also. Kids also. Maybe not even. Maybe kids is a little more natural because、mm-hmm. they like grab and throw each other. And like, you put two kids on the mat and you tell them go, it, it's beautiful. Yeah. Off, it, whether they know jujitsu or not, they're doing jujitsu.、Yeah. It's like two animals.、Yeah. You know? But adults are a little more cautious, have more questions, have more doubts. You know, what if this? What if that? What if the kid, a kid, you could show a kid an arm bar wrong and he's going to do it wrong. You、mm-hmm. know, he doesn't question you. He doesn't say, oh, but what if the. No, he'll do it wrong. He'll do it right. He'll do whatever you tell him. But I think that. The gi should be something that you get after you've proved that you want to do this. You know, you should do jujitsu for one, two, maybe three months. No gi, fundamentals. Learn a rear naked choke. Learn how to put hooks in on the back. Learn how to establish a mount.、Mm-hmm. You know, learn how to establish a side control. Learn an Americana. Learn an arm bar. Learn a triangle. Learn an escape from an arm bar. All those things. I think you should learn without the variable of a gi because、mm-hmm. it's way less complicated. Yeah. And then you're like, hey, look, you're doing great. Now you get to use this, you know? Now, and not after like two years because I think the gi is great. It slows things down, it helps you learn, you know? Yeah, I But, think it's more refined, right? Yeah. You, you have more possibilities. More possibilities. And, you, and just. Expand your it's, vision. Yeah, and it slows it down. You know, that, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. argument of like, oh, the geese super fast, it is. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. It's fireworks. Blah, 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 it's sweaty. You get an arm bar. The guy slips out. Blah, blah, blah. You're like, fuck, the arm bar doesn't work because the guy's so slippery. Yeah. And then you learn how to really do an arm bar 
because the guy's going to slip out. So yeah. you have to have your hips in tight and everything has to be tight and you can't do it too fast. And then when you start doing it in the gi, you're like, whoa, everything's a little more slow motion. The speed's a little bit slower. And now I can grab the gi to not lose the arm. And now I can, you know, so I don't think that you need to like only train no gi or no gi for like two years. But, but I think that you should start maybe like at least one month, your first month. Like, like even the guy, if you don't know you're going to do jujitsu forever, you have to buy a gi. Mm -hmm. you know and then you buy a gi and you do it for two weeks and you don't like it and you're like i'm never gonna do this again and then you never do it again then that gi sits in your closet for 10 years five years and then you're like maybe i'm gonna try jujitsu again you still have this brand new gi you know that happens a lot yeah i think it should be like try it in no gi first do like one month of no gi and then be like hey this is cool i want to continue i want to sign up i want to do a contract whatever one year five years and then it's like, cool, here's your gi. Here's your prep. Now you're ready to put this gi on and to receive this white belt. You know, I think it's something like, no, I think in that way. Very interesting. And I've, I've seen that having a school, having no gi classes, no gi fundamental classes and gi fundamental classes. Now this year, a lot of the students who sign up they just go to the nogi classes right when they sign up mm -hmm. brand new guys white belt guys you know and it it's way easier for yeah. me as an instructor it's way easier i'm stoked i'm like sick but and i don't put too much pressure on them to go to the to the gi classes because eventually they they go just a nogi just a nogi fundamental classes and then they'll start to go to like the nogi noon class which is a little mixed you know there's like i have like nogi all levels at noon and then fundamentals at 5 30 and advanced at 6 30 so then after they start feeling comfortable they'll go to the noon classes and then they see like the guys who train in the gear are better than them you know and like the guys who train in the gear are cool mm. and they start to develop this like oh I, I kind of want the gi, you know, I kind of, I want one of those, you know, hey, where do I get a gi, you know, and then they start coming to the gi class and they're like, whoa, this is way harder than the no gi, you know, this is like way more, why are you grabbing me here, why are you, and yeah. then they start to want to be good at that too, you know, they start to develop this like love for the gi versus the gi being this thing that's like, why am I wearing this? Why do you have to do this? This isn't, this doesn't work on the streets, you know? Cause if you put a gi on the guy and you show him a cross choke, the first thing is going to be like, oh, but the guy in the streets isn't wearing a yeah, gi. Exactly. You know? And then you have to explain that. And I've had mm -hmm. to explain that my whole life to people. And I got tired of explaining that, <laughs> you know, I'm like, bro, okay. Nobody's naked on the streets, you know, but you could grab the shirt and do a cross choke with the shirt. But in reality, you're not going to do that. If yeah. you're a black belt in jujitsu, you're not going to cross choke some guy in the streets. You're going to no. pin him down, put your knee on his stomach, slap him one time. He's going to turn his back and you're going to get a rear naked choke or just pin him. You know, yeah. you don't need to learn in a gi to be able to do a self-defense situation. You know, I think that the gi is what's cool. The gi is like the, the longevity of jujitsu. If you want to train forever if you want to train when you're 50 60 70 years old you have to train in the gi mm -hmm. no gi is too much you it's fucking all crazy and too fast and you get hurt a little bit more and so eventually after a while if you really fall in love with the sport with the with the art you'll want to train in the gi you'll develop a passion for the gi but if you just you get forced to do the gi right off the bat you'll instantly like i mean not everybody but half the people will instantly be like i hate this thing i hate this thing why are you grabbing me here why are you pulling me there it's such a weird thing for the like i i see it you know having mm -hmm. a jujitsu school i have new student come in every week you know and some of them come to the gi class and i'm like here here's a gi you can borrow 
Papa, keep for however long you want until you buy one. And watching them interact in that first class is always very awkward compared to the guy who walks in on a nogi day, you know, and goes, hey, I want to try a class. Okay, cool. Today's nogi. Cool. Can, can I wear this? Perfect. Yeah. No problem. I would ask you, uh, you, you train know? like in a normal t-shirt, t-shirt, not a rash guard, uh -huh. right? This is another, I think, aspect of, of your, of uh -huh. your academy. Um, yeah, man, I just, I just, I feel like I grew up in Gracie Baja, mm -hmm. you know, with so many rules my whole life. I had to wear the uniform, couldn't wear even like my sponsors. I couldn't wear their geese and stuff in training and every, they came up with the rule of like, now you have to wear, the, first it was like the gi. Mm -hmm. You have to wear the gi. And then it was like, you have to wear a shirt under. Yeah. Because in America, right? Nobody wants to see your hairy chest on their face or the girls don't want to have you fucking with a bare chest, blah, blah, blah. So then it became the rule of like, you, now you have to have something under the gi. And then it developed to like, now it has to be a Gracie Baja rash guard under the gi, mm -hmm. you know? And then for the no gi, it was the uniform. First, you had to wear the pants and the rash guard with the belt. Yeah. And then the shorts came out. And then it was like, now you have to wear the Gracie Baja shorts, the Gracie Baja rash guard and the belt. And then they're like, why are we wearing the belt? Okay, no more belt. Now just the Gracie Baja shorts and the Gracie Baja rash guard. And then I feel like I was in that deal for such a long time that after when I opened my own school, I was just like, I want to do whatever I want, you know? Mm -hmm. And I want to have my own style, you know? I always liked watching these, those like ADCC matches where people have their own, their own style. It look nobody looks the same. It's kind of, it's like, if you watch UFC nowadays, you know, yeah, it's, it's hard to follow because everybody it's looks boring. the same. Yeah. I, I have a hard time following UFC because everybody looks the same. It's like this fucking Russian dude with Reebok shorts. Mm -hmm. They all look the same. It's this six foot three black dude with Reebok shorts and they all look the same. And it's this white dude with a bunch of tattoos and Reebok shorts and they all look the same. And, There's no style. Back in the day, it was like, whoa, this guy's wearing pants and no shirt. And this guy's wearing a gi top with no pants. And yeah. this guy's wearing wrestling shoes. And this guy's wearing, you know? So you got to see like this difference um, in art, in, in, in the, the different arts collide, mm -hmm. you know? And you see that, um, you see that in, in ADCC because it's, there's a lot of like, Like back in the day, not so much anymore. Now it's mainly just jujitsu guys in, in an ADCC, you know? But back in the day, you would see a wrestler yeah. wearing a singlet yeah. in an ADCC mm -hmm. match. You know, you'd see a Sambo guy. And people without the shirt. People yeah. without the yeah, shirt. Without you'd the see a Sambo yeah. guy. You'd see a guy with shoes on and you're like, bro, what the fuck? Why are you wearing shoes? Yeah. The guy's going to break your leg, break your heel hook. You know, he's going to heel hook you. Yeah. Like, why are you wearing shoes? But and the guy's like, that's my style. This is what I, you know, that's what he does. And, and um, you'd see people wearing shirts and stuff like that and a little more casual. And so I kind of just wanted to be a little more casual like that and i train every day you know i train with the rash guard on i train with the shirt on i train with gi pants on and a shirt or rash guard sometimes when all my shorts are dirty you know I'll wear gi pants and i don't have like a rule like mm -hmm. i only train in a t-shirt you know so i think that um when i did the adcc trials the first one in in the east coast and i wore a t-shirt um everybody kind of was like whoa you know he's like one of the only guys wearing a t-shirt and and even there in the in the east coast when i did the first trials there was a bunch of people wearing t-shirt there's a bunch of wrestlers you know east coast mm -hmm. wrestlers wearing fucking crazy shit but then when i came to the brazil trials in balneario i was the only athlete 
in the whole trials with the t-shirt on and i feel like it like here in brazil like everybody wants to have that like little professional look you know like the same brand shorts and top that Mm -hmm. are matching that Mm -hmm. because it kind of shows that maybe they have a sponsor or they're a little more classy you know they want to like get away from that like messy look you know because like I saw this interview of like Marcelo Garcia a long time ago. Um, the guy asked him, he's like, oh, why do you wear a T-shirt? And he's like, because I, I can't afford rash guards. And the guy's like, what do you mean? He's like, rash guards are expensive, man. I wear like the oldest T-shirt I have to Nogi because that shit's going to get ripped anyways. And I can wash it. I can throw it away. I don't care about the shirt, you know? So it kind of gives it this like, grudgy look you know this Mm -hmm. kind of rougher look and i think that like like i got a lot of shit a lot of people liked it you know the t-shirt thing and then a lot of people were like why are you guys let hit this guy wear a t-shirt it looks bad it looks unprofessional it looks blah 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 and it's like why do you care you know why do you care if i have a little bit different style yeah then so there and, wasn't anything like and here in brazil you you made the finals right and yeah. everyone was talking about you you were like in, in this crazy style <laughs> and a, 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 a american with long hair yeah and, and and then you got to the finals with with mika but you you were uh, like a fighter that really caught the the attention of everyone yeah, yeah. because I, i think you 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 got you you got everyone like yeah you, all submissions all submissions yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think in that trial I had like um I had like six matches to get to the finals and Mika had four mm-hmm. and we both had all submissions and I think that his his mat time total was like one minute less than mine. Mm-hmm. Um with two less matches, you know. But um but yeah, I came I came from the, for that trial I was very hungry. I did really well in the east coast yeah. trials i lost to lost to cade uh-huh. um in a really close match and um and then we did a i taught a training camp in mexico with cade and ty mm-hmm. two weeks before the trials here and got to train with them a lot before that and they like motivated me a lot like we trained a lot at that camp and and for a week straight and they're like bro You're going to go out there and win. You feel great, ba ba ba. So I came like really hungry for that trials. Here you already knew that you could got you could, could got Mika in the the final match. I had no clue. I didn't no. know if I was going to get Mika first round, second round, you know. There was a lot of big names in the in the division anyways. Yeah. I was just focused on one fight for one fight at a time, you know. Um But yeah, I came. I came as I came for, to Brazil for two weeks. That time, and there was two trials. Mm-hmm. You know, there's the Balneário one and the São Paulo one. And I came with a friend, and I was like, m- like I had it in my head. I was like, I'm doing this first trials. I'm gonna win, and then vacation for one week. You know, we're not going to São Paulo. Fuck going to São Paulo. Mm-hmm. And then. Yeah, I lost in the finals and I had to go to Sao Paulo. But yeah. I came with the idea of like, I'm going to win this one and then just vacation for a week. You know, so I was very, very hungry in that first, that first trials here in Brazil. Uh, what do you think about the, the footlocks and uh, all the things uh, that is also being a lot discussed like in in the game like in the sports uh, if is or if we teach them in the early days or, or not or mm-hmm. only for advanced class mm-hmm. how, do, how how do you see this man honestly i think the sooner the better um like i grew up in a in a in in a gym in an environment where it was very that kind of style the mm-hmm. don't learn them till you're advanced you know yeah. only start doing full locks when you're purple belt and 
Like you're not allowed to learn knee bars until you're a brown belt. And I think that's just wrong because the, you, you develop this fear, you know, for the, for the leg locks. You, you're like, whoa, it's super dangerous, right? Or anytime somebody grabs your foot, you have to tap right away. And now you see it like it's now you're starting to see less and less finishes from leg locks because they're not that hard to defend. Mm -hmm. If you do, if you know what you're doing and you're doing it right, it's really hard to finish somebody with a heel hook. If they know how to defend it, there's people that will like put their leg right there and sit there all day defending no problem you know so i think it's something that like the sooner you learn it the more comfortable you're gonna be the better you'll be at defending it um especially nowadays with like there's a lot of cross training a lot of visitors a lot of travelers you know yeah. jiu-jitsu travelers that go to california and visit gyms and stuff and and you see guys that come into gyms like i see guys that come into my gyms that are super leg lock guys you know and they'll they'll come in and they'll tap a bunch of my students out with leg locks and some some of my students who like don't put too much focus on the leg locks you know and they'll maybe the guy's like a blue belt or a purple belt and they'll tap out like a brown belt who like doesn't focus too much on mm -hmm. the leg locks and stuff yeah. you know and it's like that's their little key you know they can't pass your guard they can't take your back but they can heel hook you if you don't know what you're doing you know yeah and so I think the sooner the better to learn that stuff. I think it's really important for girls specifically. For the girls. Um, very important. I see like, like we teach leg locks right off the bat. Um, I don't teach them like in the fundamentals class, you know, they're, that those classes are more focused on positional stuff and mm -hmm. just learning how to move around and stuff. But in the, in the all levels in the noon classes, the classes, there's white belts, there's people who is their first week second week in jujitsu and sometimes we do leg locks and heel hooks and stuff like that and it's cool to see the guys like just feel the position you know there's nothing wrong with drilling it and yeah. and um what i tell people at our school is like there's um no white belt on white belt leg locks mm -hmm. you know like a white belt can't do leg locks on a white belt but a blue can do on a white belt blue can do on a white belt white can do on a blue belt they they already have a little like if you've never done leg locks and you're a blue belt you don't know you're a white belt at leg locks mm -hmm. you know but if you're if you've been doing leg locks since you're a white belt and then you're a blue belt you you already know the danger yeah you know when you get a white belt and they don't know what they're doing you like explain that you're like hey dude i got you look but and then they feel like oh okay you know you you don't but if you don't know what you're doing you don't know if you have it you don't know if it's right so you want to crank it you want to go hard you yeah. know but if you already know and i see it um a lot in the girls that we have at our school um they love leg locks i don't know why but i think it's because it keeps their upper body away from the guy you know and they can like be far away from the person and not have to fight hand to hand with a guy who's mm -hmm. like way stronger and when a girl wraps her legs around you you feel you know you feel yeah. way they're way stronger yeah. with their legs with you know dad, yeah so it showed like they they develop this comfort and i think that um in a self-defense situation If a girl knows how to do some crazy, complicated dive under, spin, wrap the legs, kick the guy down, heel hook, dude, yeah. that's the best case scenario. Yeah. For a girl to break the guy's knee and then get up and be like, fuck you and walk <laughs> away and the guy's not going to be chasing her versus the girl like break the wrist grip and run and what the no. guy's gonna fucking run too you know what i mean yeah it's like that that chase is never gonna end and eventually they'll end up on the ground and for a girl to arm bar a guy like i could let a girl arm bar me and just hold it like this and be like uh oh, whatever mm -hmm. you know but if a girl gets a heel hook and goes hard it's gonna break your knee 
you know so i see the the girls even like the white our white belts and blue belts purple belt girls they instantly develop a love for leg locks you know and it's cool to see like i have like a couple blue belt girls that'll like tap white belts with leg locks you know like white belt men mm -hmm. you know and and you see like the the guys like scared you know and they <laughs> tap soon because they're like whoa, whoa, whoa. but they really don't want to tap you know but they'll only tap to like a leg lock mm -hmm. you know like an arm they'll let their arm pop and be like oh i didn't tap no i did that didn't hurt you know but to leg locks they get like scared and the girls get all um aggressive with it and so i think that the sooner you learn that stuff the better the you should learn complete jujitsu right off the bat. Nice. You know, you should be introduced to what is what is a leg lock, what is a heel hook. Hey, look, this is a heel hook. It's very dangerous. Yeah. It can ruin your life. Yeah. You know, have respect for it. Mm -hmm. That's how you show somebody. You don't say, "Hey, this is a heel hook. You're not allowed to learn this for five years. You have to learn everything else, and then in five years we'll show you this." And then in five years, you're going to learn that and you're going to suck at it, you know, and it's going to be this thing that now you got to get good at that. You know, I think that you should just kind of start to learn it complete with a little bit of restrictions. Like I said, you know, some sometimes I tell some of the blue belts like, hey, you're not allowed to do leg locks to white belts. Like you're still kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you can, you can, but you're no leg locks to white belts. You know, you can only leg lock people who are higher level than you. Like if you can leg lock a purple belt, whatever. He mm -hmm. knows he's going to tap in time. He's going to, you yeah. know. But um, I think that you should not have this instant fear of like a leg lock. You know, there's there's way more positions that are more dangerous than jujitsu, neck cranks and yeah, stuff like that, yeah, that sure. are like that yeah. kind of stuff. Let's talk about self-defense. How, how do you see self-defense? Because you, we, we just talked about the leg locks and the, the girl stuff. And do you train self-defense? Do you put self-defense in, in your training session? How, how, how do you see self-defense? Um, man, self-defense, I did a lot, you know. I, I grew up training in Gracie Baja and in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I taught my whole life self-defense i trained the self-defense all the classes in the gracie baja curriculum especially in the fundamentals start with a little bit of self-defense yeah you know um i think it's great uh to have that background because there's situations where self-defense is like a like i can't just show you something once you know and then you know yeah maybe you know how to do the position okay mm -hmm. and i know one month i ask you and you know and i'm like how do you do this but you know but i think it's something that you have to drill so much especially for somebody who's gonna be in a self-defense situation you know maybe not like a stronger guy whatever but somebody who's weak or, or a girl i think that the way that gracie baja does it that they put it in their curriculum in the beginning of a class, five, 10 minutes, maybe the warm up is a self defense move, I think is great because it makes you um, comfortable with the situation. You know, it makes you, if, if the situation, the main thing about self defense is the panic. You yeah. know, you can't panic. And if you just drill a position once in a while, and then you end up in this situation, everything's going to go out the window and you're ah, going to start screaming and not know what to do, yeah. you know? But if you drill it all the time, all the time, and it becomes automatic, then you will have no problem with it. You have, I've, I, I teach a lot of private classes to friends, maybe like guys who train and they want their daughters to learn self-defense, but they don't want their daughters to do jujitsu, mm -hmm. you know, because they train there and they're like, no, nah, I don't want my daughter to come in here and roll with all these guys and stuff, but I want her to learn self-defense. Can I get some privates from you, you know? And what I tell them is like, the way that I do it is like, I sell a package and I tell them like, here's the deal. You gotta, I'll, I'll do like five classes with your daughter every like, 
three months, you know, and we do like five classes in two weeks, mm -hmm. you know, practice a lot, a lot of repetition, a lot of scenario games, you know, I play like games of like teach a bear hug escape and then, okay, I'm going to bear hug you here and I have to take you out the door. And if you don't, if you don't get out by the time you get out the door, you lose, mm -hmm. you know, like those kinds of games to make them put it in the situation where they, they see it and they're like, oh shit, it's not, it's not that easy. Yeah. You know, it's not yeah. just a uh, push here and yeah. you're out, you know, it's like, I'll show you the move. They practice, they think it's easy. And then when I do it, I take them out of the door nine out of 10 times, you know? And mm -hmm. they're like, oh my gosh, I only got out one time, you know? And it's because in, in those situations, every second counts. You know, in a jujitsu match, it's a little different. It's a five minute, 10 minute match. There's a lot of uh, like play time. Yeah. But in a self-defense situation, it's 10 seconds, 15 mm -hmm. seconds. Every single second counts. When the guy hugs you, when the guy grabs you, you already have to know the react, the proper reaction. You know, when the guy's going to punch you, you already have, it has to be something automatic. And so... I, I tell these guys, like, sometimes um, I'll do a package of five and I'll do two, two weeks of classes. And then I'll be like, okay, let's do another one in, like, three months, you know? And, and just to review that stuff and to keep it fresh and comfortable. And, and um, I think it's really important to know. Um, nowadays, like, in, in my school, I have a lot of students who is like after a while of just doing jujitsu i'm confident that they can defend themselves however because they're just good at jujitsu you know you learn a good base especially with nogi i think like in my in my school we do a lot of stand-up a lot of wrestling a lot of grip fighting standing grabbing the head like the warm-up is always that never like running around the mat It's like, okay, get a partner and just play, you mm -hmm. know, five minutes, go touch the head, fake shot, grab, pull, pa, pa. And this, this kind of stuff makes you so comfortable with those kinds of situation where somebody can grab you, you know, and you, you're like, whoa, this guy feels like a white belt, yeah. you know, that I have nothing to worry about, you know, um, that I think that it's important to know for specific people. For some people, it's not as important, you know? Um, personally, I think I've had to use, I can think of like one real situation that I had to use like the basic super, like the guy swings to punch, mm -hmm. block, seonagi. I've had to do that one time in my entire life. Yeah. Was here in Brazil at a concert Some guy got in an argument with my uncle, Pa, and my uncle, we were at a concert. My uncle was kind of drunk and talking to some chick, and this guy was trying to start shit with him, and I split them up, and, like, I pushed the guy a little hard, you know, and he came at me and swung, and I felt like Jackie Chan, you know? I was the first time I ever had to use, I was 19, I was already a black belt, mm -hmm. you know? But the guy swung, And automatic, I went boom, Seo Nagi, pa. The guy land there and hit his back on the ground. So, <gasps> you know, had a hard time breathing. And um, but other than that, I've never had to use any kind of self defense. But I think it's because I've learned how to avoid those situations. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you train jujitsu, just jujitsu. You, you can feel situations happening. You can yeah. see tension and fights. And like, man, I, I, I was a purple belt, brown. I was a brown belt in high school, you know, mm -hmm. at, at 17, 18. I was a brown belt. So when I'd go to high school parties with my friends that didn't train jujitsu, anytime they would get in an argument with somebody, They will call me and be like, oh, this Majid's got my back. Majid's, and I'm like, bro, I don't have shit. <laughs> this is your problem. You know, this is not me. And I would always tell them like, man, it's like Friday night. I just taught competition class 
in my dad's school from six to eight, went home, showered, and then came to this party. Do you think I want to fight this blue belt? <laughs> white, what, do you think I want to fight this white belt? You know, I just trained with brown belts and black belts all night. No way. So I, you learn how to avoid those situations. You want to avoid those situations. You yeah. know, most people, some people are crazy and want to get in fights and there's mm -hmm. nothing you can do about it. But um, I think that a lot of self-defense is just learning how to avoid those kinds of situations yeah. and that when they come about, being natural, being comfortable, not having to think, you know. Um, some, I think the most important self-defense thing is not arguing yeah. too close. Yeah. Which you see all the time, people right here face to face. Mm -hmm. fucking, I think that is crazy. Mm -hmm. Personally, I've seen people get headbutted multiple times. And having your hands up, you know, yeah. how like a lot of the graces talk about like yeah. if you, anyone's starting to have tension or stuff, your hands are right here and you're casual. Yeah. You're not like this. You're not like this. You're here and you're like, hey, man, I don't want to have any problem. Blah, blah, blah. Just that, just teaching somebody that can change their life, yeah. you know, can change their aspect of like how to avoid a situation. If somebody argues with you and you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like I've, sh I've shown that to a lot of my friends who don't train jujitsu. Like, hey man, I saw you last night. You got in an argument with this guy. Nothing happened, you know? But what if that guy was fucking crazy and threw a punch? You would've got knocked out mm -hmm. because you were fucking standing there like this and like, what motherfucker, what? what? Always argue like this. It's okay to argue. You're mad. Maybe you're drunk. The guy's drunk. Something happened, whatever. But always argue like this. Be ready to push the guy and check your distance and be like, hey, don't get too close. Don't get too close. You know, I've had to, I've had to use those kinds of things multiple times. Mm -hmm. You know, people arguing and they try to get close. And I'm like, dude, stay here. <laughs> tell me what you want to tell me from here. If you get inside of this, I'm going to have to hug you and put you down. And then you can tell me, you know, but I'm not going to let you get come here and kiss me, you know, no way. So I think that learning that is the most valuable thing because it, it teaches you how to look for scenarios, how to avoid scenarios, you yeah. know, how to feel a situation, yeah. you know, um, and I'm 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 super thankful for growing up in a Gracie Baja where it was taught over and over and it got to the point where, you know, you get so comfortable with situations like that, it just becomes natural. Talking about your future now as a competitor or as a coach, I don't know. What what, what do you think for the future? Um I wanna I don't know, I wanna keep doing what I'm doing. I have a few more years of competing in me. Um, hopefully a couple more ADCCs. Try to get on the podium. Um, I want to expand this school that we have, Surf Fight, mm -hmm. that Joel and I have. Um, we have an, a, a game plan of expanding and beach cities with good waves <laughs> nice. you know and and putting schools first um starting with san diego and maybe putting we're like right in the middle of san diego right now of the coast yeah. mm -hmm. and we want to put one south and one north and kind of like we're i think the only school right now that's on the 101 in san diego mm -hmm. and i want to try to like keep that up keep up schools that are coastal in front of the beach and um try to attract those kinds of people you know people that have similar mindsets nice and um i think that there's so much focus on like especially now in the united states of like putting a school in the middle of nowhere where there's no other jujitsu schools and i'll let you go to the middle of nowhere, you know, have fun in the middle of nowhere. I want to stay in like nice coastal cities and, and, um, yeah, we have a plan to eventually put schools in like Australia and Japan and places that we like to travel to that have good waves and, and, um, expand in that sense and just keep pushing jujitsu and try to get that, create that 
culture of surf fight, you know, surfing yeah. and jujitsu and really integrate that because um, I feel like it was such a big uh, part of jujitsu in the beginning and the yeah. roots, you know, yeah. like every every guy, even like all the Gracies, you see Hickson, Hoyler, you know, all those guys surf and train jujitsu. And, and um, I think that now with the way that things are going, how many schools there are, it's starting to like go away from that, you know? And so I think it's our job to like kind of maintain that connection yeah. of surfing and jujitsu and um, creating an environment for those kinds of people, you know, who are, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of jujitsu going on, you know, and a lot of schools opening and, and some schools are more focused for competitors some yeah. schools are more focused for the nerds and the you know they're super pretty and white and clean and and want to attract more people who are who are timid who are scared like i had a big talk with carlinos last year after the trials i went to floripa and spent a little time at the headquarters there at the gracie baja and talked to carlinos about it for the first time, you know, I was like, man, I'm sorry I didn't open a Gracie Baja, you know, but I had a different idea and especially for right now. And I was very happy at what he told me. He was very stoked. He said that he's like, man, I don't see any problem with what you're doing. You are in your 20s. And when I was in my he's like, when I was in my 20s and my 30s, I just wanted to run the competition classes. I just wanted to put confetti and see people fight and be like, you go with you. And he's like, that's what's fun. Yeah. That's the fun. He's yeah. like, because when I was there, I was training. Uh, it was in between the Bonne Aria and the Sao Paulo trials. And he was pushing the training. You know, he like called Massimo. He's like, bro, Massimo, Majid's here. Bring some guys. We got to get them ready. Right. And he was there. And you go with you and, you. and you could see like this excitement, you know, this stoke. And he was like, bro, that's what I love to do. You know, he's like, do you think I want to teach the nerd how to do a hip escape every fucking day? That's work. Yeah. You know, and I think that right now, especially while I'm still young, I want to try to push this culture, create this culture of like tough jujitsu that's not watered down too much and um, that's still fun and a little loose and fun and not so serious, you know, and maybe who knows, like eventually when I'm older, my path will change, you know, and I'll pass that on to one of my students mm -hmm. and be like, now you take over the tough guys and i want to focus on people who pay the bills you know people yeah. who have money and who are gonna pay the bills on time every time and not cancel the cards and stuff yeah. like that you know so i think that while i'm still young and i still have this fire in me and i want to have competitor students and i want to like help hopefully one of my students this year get into adcc with me you know that's like my goal so um, I have some students that are competing and doing really good. And yeah, that's the plan. Try to bring up a couple guys with me and pass on that same fire that was in me, you know? Nice. Very to nice. Keep that going. Bro, very grateful to have you. You're very special for, for me and for Buddha. Hey, for, for the me project. too, man. You, I, I don't even know why I'm here. You have so many legends on this podcast. I'm you are like, a legend also. What am I doing? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, bro. Admire a lot of your your job. And, Thank you. And what Thank what you. you pass, and how you pass the message of jujitsu. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs>